for that lovely, generous introduction. It's such an honor to speak with you today about one of my absolute favorite topics, how mindfulness can shape and regulate metabolism and how these effects can translate to the next generation through pregnancy. Our mind, as you heard from Judd, our mind is a predictive mind. And if we live in a threat state, we are shaping our brain and biology toward preparedness, toward vigilance. And if we're a pregnant person, we're also shaping the brain of the next generation to expect adversity, to be wired toward stress reactivity. So let's first just do a check-in amongst ourselves. We heard beautiful music that for some of us led us to be very relaxed this morning. And let's just see where we're at now. So I'd like you to close your eyes and just ask, what is present? What thoughts, feelings are present for you now? What emotions might you be able to identify and label? And what's present in your body? What tension, pressure, holding might be present? Really, what have you carried here from the past or from mind travel to the future? You can open your eyes. One last question. How content and satisfied do you feel in terms of your hunger, your appetite? We don't usually ask ourselves that question. We don't usually pay attention to our interoceptive awareness, our body signals. So what we know and what you probably observed in those few seconds is that even though we're sitting here paying attention, our mind is also carrying stress from many sources, from our body, from our mind. And so that's the most common form of stress, our thoughts. So my favorite model is really thinking in a granular way about well, what mind state are we in right now and checking in with data and using the awareness that we have, which is our most precious and valuable tool for wellness and health to move through mind states. So this is a model from a paper that we just published, not as colorful in the academic journal as here, but what you can see is that, of course, we have these hot red mind states, the acute stress response, which is beautiful. There's nothing wrong with it. It helps us perform. We need it. It's why we're here today. And then there's these yellow mind states, which is what we all lurk in most of the day, which most of us are in right now. And that is this moderate threat state of carrying unconscious stress that we might not be aware of. And uh, Judd mentioned the default mode network. So we have these set points that we typically aren't aware of that we can become aware of. And then there's green and blue mind states. And I'll talk more about the restorative, reparative nature of blue mind states and how to get there on Sunday. But today I wanna to focus on red and yellow mind states because not only do they jack up our nervous system, but they also lead us to evolutionarily seek and crave sugar and fat to be preoccupied, to feel unsatisfied even after we eat. And so threat and safety, these feelings drive these mind states and for many people drive our metabolic health. So the challenge or the problem is simply that stress drives this toxic diet that leads to the state of insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is the major highway to diseases, even, even mental diseases and dementia. Insulin resistance is underlying all of the major diseases of aging, heart disease, diabetes, cancer. And so we know that feeling stress, the stress physiology mixed with comfort food, the dense calories, high sugars, carbs, fat, creates this insulin resistant state. So there's the pancreas. And when we have high insulin, it in turn fuels cravings. So there's the sugar cube. So it's this vicious cycle. 
How do we regulate this? Of course we hope for a pill. Right now there is none without side effects that can actually regulate our nervous system and our cravings. And so I like to quote the Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, the way out is in, is using our awareness. And so we have been for over a decade refining interventions to cultivate targeted mindfulness for regulating appetite and regulating the nervous system. So we train people on interoceptive awareness and we train them on feeling social safety and letting themselves enter green and blue mind states. And that in turn can improve and reduce this uncomfortable state of wanting compulsive eating and regulate the nervous system and in turn reduce particularly intra-abdominal fat. This is not about being overweight necessarily. This applies to all of us in terms of our body shape and storing the type of fat that creates diabetes centrally. Okay, so what do we do in this intervention? In addition to the mind training, we need to change the substrate that people are eating, which is often a, you know, highly processed fast food. And so we turn attention toward the rainbow, the, the widest spectrum of fruits and vegetables that lead us toward an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory diet. In a sense, we flood the brain with these, with these chemicals that both restore the brain mood as well as metabolic health. And steer people away from the fake rain rainbow, the seduction of the hedonic food, processed food. So we've done many trials. I'm gonna tell you quickly about two. In our first trial, our larger trial, an NIH-controlled trial, we had 200 adults with obesity, and they all had behavioral counseling for lifestyle change. They had groups, they learned how to change diet and exercise, which we know doesn't typically last. And then half the group received the mindfulness training, mindful eating, mindful stress regulation. And let me tell you what we found. First of all, at, at six months, groups looked similar in terms of weight loss and metabolic health. What we really care about is insulin resistance. Underlying weight, which is very hard to change, is true health, metabolic health. So in this trial, we, we examined, uh, we actually took fat cells out of people. They were so generous that many people let us stick a needle into their belly and, and uh, collect fat cells. And what we found is the mindfulness group reduced inflammation, reduced levels of inflammation spewing out of their adipocytes. And in terms of their overall health, they, they had better insulin resistance, they had lower glucose at 12 months and 18 months. So we find these long-term effects for regulating metabolism. Their mood was better 18 months later, in part through these increases in mindfulness. And lastly, their nervous system showed a more resilient pattern to stress afterward, away from the threat response and more toward a positive challenge stress response. So we're very excited about understanding that many people need this self-regulation training for any behavior change, and we know how to, to gear this toward eating and weight. And we want to apply it toward pregnancy. Pregnancy is an incredibly sensitive, critical period when there's tremendous neuroplasticity, both for the woman because of estrogen as well as high motivation, and for the baby as the brain develops. So we also know that both maternal health shapes baby's weight, baby's aging from day one of life, sh shorter telomeres, for example, as well as stress and trauma. Women who experience stress and trauma during pregnancy have babies with shorter telomeres and more adiposity. And we, we and others have shown this now. So we really need to get in there during pregnancy, this potent period where short-term interventions may have an effect for two generations. Our intervention looks very, very similar very simplified. We worked on interoceptive awareness through mindful eating, mindful movement, as well as breathing, holding the belly, slowing breathing, sending metta, sending love, loving kindness to the baby, to oneself, to everyone. Love is very stress reducing. We also used an app uh, which really was a, a good aid for them right before eating for mindful awareness and interoception, as well as for when they felt stressed. So what did we find? Here is one of our ways, one of our cohorts of women coming back for the reunion with their baby. At this point, what we found is that the women had 
dramatically improved glucose tolerance, much lower risk for diabetes than our treatment as usual. Pregnancy treatment as usual is not very much care. It's from prenatal visits. We found that they had lower depression eight weeks later, and we followed them. Eight years later, they still have significantly lower depression, even through COVID. So this is a tremendous return on investment, short-term intervention during pregnancy, long-term mental health benefit. Now, what about the babies? The babies had benefits to their health. They were less sick in the first year of life. They had six fewer doctor's visits. Their nervous system also showed a resilient stress response. We shaped their autonomic nervous system to respond in a more a healthy way to acute stressors. So we're very excited about this, and other people are as well, stakeholders. So our next steps are dissemination. We have several uh, partners interested in trying this to disseminate it globally through YMCA, so we're looking for a funded pilot through the community partners, and we also have healthcare providers like HealthNet who wants to adopt this in their health system. So that is, of course, a researcher's biggest hope, is that when you have something, you don't just keep studying it, you, sh you share it out, you find ways to disseminate it. We still don't know the exact mechanisms, though. There's a lot of room for optimizing and discovery. And so we are um, planning our next study, which is using essential self-technology, a term coined by Linda Stone, who many of you know, which is really thinking about how can we use technology to actually look inward and self-regulate, be more present and more balanced and joyful in our life, rather than take, distracting us and taking us out of our life. And so we are planning that for the next study to, to use self-monitoring, use our app, but also look at how glucose is responding to stress, to eating, and how the nervous system is responding. And we know, of course, the mom's nervous system is gonna also reflect and affect the baby's nervous system. And lastly, we'll be able to discover transmission of pathways of aging. Do the babies come out with different mitochondria, telomeres, and epigenetics? So, Stay tuned. If you're interested in learning more, um, I would love to talk to any of you about this mindful, mindful nutrition for w metabolism and particularly for pregnancy. Thank you so much.